Um, I'm Brian Tomasic. Um, many of you may know me. I am currently a um, researcher on altruism, and I maintain the website Essays on Reducing Suffering. Um, I'll focus on reducing suffering is what I um, in the topics that I t discuss, but a lot of what I say is more applicable to whatever altruistic cause you're interested in. Um, so um, I'll tell a little, little bit about my background. I um, started out as a um, fairly normal um, uh, teenager. I played video games and so on. Um, I grew up in um, near Albany, New York, um, upstate New York. Um, in um, When I was in eighth grade, um, in the year 2000, I discovered um, um, politics and activism. Um, the main influence was Ralph Nader, who is an um, American consumer advocate and political activist. Um, he gave a lecture at a local college talking about the importance of um, working on social issues, being civically active, and um, making a difference, um, and the fact that people in Western countries have a big um, ability to make an influence. So that was really inspiring, and it um, encouraged me to be interested in um, political issues. So I began reading about um, political news, um, especially um, left-wing kinds of um, ideas. Um, and so I, I um, was interested especially in um, poverty and environmentalism during high school. Um, those um, views would eventually change, but um, at the time, that's what seemed most important. Um, in, um, when I was in uh, 11th grade, I had a teacher who encouraged um, his students to write philosophical essays. Um, he introduced us to philosophy, which is not normally taught in um, high school curriculum. Um, and so we wrote a philosophical essay, 500 words every week, um, and that got me in the habit of writing um, essays about these kinds of topics. So um, I continued the habit even after the, the course had ended, and I kind of kept a journal where I wrote down essays um, about things like um, what I cared about, um, things like the importance of happiness rather than um, like um, other more instrumental goals. Um, things like the importance of doing cost-effective calculations. Um, and I was doing this kind of naively based on general concepts that were discussed. Um, so in 2005, when I learned about utilitarianism, I was interested to see that <clears throat> there was a philosophy that kind of encapsulated a lot of what I'd been talking about already. Um, so when I discovered utilitarianism, I um, began reading um, Peter Singer's writings. Um, and I agreed with a lot of what he said, including about um, donating to help um, address world poverty, um, bioethics in general, um, the importance of cost-effectiveness thinking. Um, one thing that I hadn't uh, appreciated before was his position on animals. Um, in fact, I, at the time, had thought that animals didn't really matter because I wasn't sure if they were sentient, and in general, I hadn't really given thought to um, animal welfare as a serious moral issue. Um, so when Peter Singer, when I read Peter Singer, I um, finally realized that actually this was important, and because of the number of animals, it was maybe the most important issue. Um, and so I soon became um, uh, vegan at the time and um, began thinking more about animals. Um, I even um, began extending beyond um, what Peter Singer talks about to think about um, the potential suffering of insects. Um, which was uh, kind of a shock to me when I first realized that insects might be able to suffer just because there are so many of them. Even in the basement of my house, there were spiders eating flies, and um, to, to think that that could be causing massive amounts of suffering was, um, um, was a big change to my worldview. Um, and wild animal suffering more generally began to seem like an important topic. Um, sometimes when um, people would say that um, like veganism doesn't make a big difference because there's so much suffering by wild animals and that should be um, like the, wild, the suffering of wild animals is just so much bigger so you can't really make a difference on that. Um, many people take that as a way to say veganism is not important. I took it in the opposite way to say wild animal suffering is very important. Um, and so <clears throat> I began to think and write more about these issues. Um, in 2006, I um, wrote to David Pierce, actually, um, in response to reading his website, and he encouraged me to get a website in his first reply. Um, and 
So that's the basis of my site essays on reducing suffering. Um, I uploaded the essays that I'd been writing um, independently to that site and, and just um, have continued adding to that ever since. Um, in around that same time, I began learning about um, more advanced issues related to altruism, uh, reading Nick Bostrom, um, Elias Yudkowsky in fall 2006, Overcoming Bias, um, came along, which um, later turned into less wrong for Yudkowsky's writings. Um, so a lot of those other kind of bigger picture issues also became um, relevant, and I began thinking about those as well. Um, and so I've continued along these lines um, ever since. Um, in maybe 2010 or 2011, the effective altruism movement came along and has been growing rapidly since then. And so I've been um, a main contributor to ideas in that uh, movement as well. Um, and so now I'll talk a little bit about some big picture ideas that I think are important in the areas of altruism, although um, there are many more details that we can get into with the questions. Um, so um, whether you're trying to reduce suffering or accomplish something else, um, there is a lot of uncertainty in, in our actions. And this is sometimes used um, as a way to downplay the importance of altruism. People sometimes say, you never know if you're making a positive impact, it's too hard, um, there's too much complexity in the world, um, what you think is good might actually be causing harm in the long run. Um, there's a classic example that David sometimes mentions of a priest who reportedly saved Hitler from drowning in a, a river, um, thinking he was doing a very good act. Um, so... Um, when it was just a sort of kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, when, when he was a young boy. Um, and so um, there is a lot of complexity, but um, the stakes are also very high. So the fact that this, these problems are hard is not a reason to um, simply give up. Um, there are many other areas in science or um, other kinds of um, academic domains where the problems are really hard and people spend um, even decades or centuries figuring out how to best um, <coughs> grapple with the problems. But they try it and they eventually make some progress. So um, I think we can do the same in altruism. Um, but we also need to think carefully about the big picture questions. Um, so just to take an example, um, there are some things that seem obvious that become less obvious when you um, think about the um, bigger picture implications. Um, for almost any altruism cause that you can think of, um, there are ways that it's good, there are ways that it's bad. Um, and it's sometimes the most paralyzing to, to weigh the good and the bad because um, it's not at all clear which one dominates. Um, there are some ways to make it stable though. For example, one approach advocated by Nick Beckstead is to use common sense um, as a prior at least um, for how we evaluate something. So the fact that many smart people think that something is good um, in general is some evidence that it's a good thing. Um, this can fail to work in um, a few cases. One is if you have um, sharply different values from most other people, although um, you might also have uncertainty about your own values um, because introspection is only so um, powerful and you might um, not properly um, understand what you would come to value if you thought more and had more experiences. Um, another reason is that many people, even elites of society, don't explicitly think about the far future and don't consider the far future overwhelmingly important. And so there might be some disconnects between um, <clears throat> what people think is a good thing in the short term versus what would be a good thing in the long term. And I'll give one clear example of that in a second. Um, so common sense is one way to, to get stabilization. Um, it's um, it's a good heuristic that if you're doing something that almost everybody else thinks is a bad thing, that's probably going in the wrong direction. Um, or at least you should be, think very carefully and um, make sure that there's no compelling reason um, for going against almost everybody else. Um, there are other ways to stabilize the um, policies that we advocate. Um, so you can also think about things that are positive some in terms of helping many value systems and not um, not hurting other value systems in a big way. So when, like um, certain policies, like for example, if you advocated more, if you thought that seatbelts were bad because they caused more meat consumption or something, or there's a parallel case in, 
for world poverty, some people are afraid that reducing world poverty will increase meat consumption as people become richer. Um, so when you hold a stance like that, um, you are in opposition to the values of many other people who um, care a lot about seatbelts or care a lot about reducing world poverty. And so that's um, one signal, uh, sort of like common sense, but it, it, um, in this case it's um, just another way of looking at the, the fact that um, there's a potentially a problem with what you're advocating because it's con contingent on what kinds of values you hold. Whereas if you um, work on something that's positive sum for many value systems, um, then there's more confidence that you're in, that what you're doing is a good thing because um, like um, it's not contingent on what values you happen to hold and it's um, um, like there's um, less um, it's also something that people can get behind in a in a mutual way so like when you do something that um, encroaches on what other people care about they're um, going to be angry and that they might um, care less about what you care about, but if you can work on something that lots of people care about, they may also do something that you care about. So there's reciprocity in um, what you work on, and when you work on something that helps many value systems, other people um, are more likely to appreciate that and maybe reciprocate. So um, it can even be beneficial for what you care about to um, just help others even without, um, without helping your own cause specifically. Um, so those are some stabilizing heuristics that can help us select causes. It, look for something that's <clears throat> at least um, consistent with common sense and um, that helps many value systems at once without hurting certain value systems too much. Um, and so um, some, some things that I think fall into this category of, um, fall into these um, constraints are um, promoting cooperation, um, both at a personal, um, group and international level, um, promoting wisdom and reflection and um, greater awareness of um, philosophical issues, and um, in general creating um, political structures, social norms, um, group dynamics, other kinds of um, social um, technologies that um, better improve society's ability to handle challenges and um, figure out important questions um, in ways that, that are good for many parties. Um, and then a third, um, a third thing that seems fairly robustly positive in the sense is to um, do meta-level activities that, f that further the previous two. Um, so for example, building a movement of people who are interested in um, effectiveness and these kinds of robust um, positive interventions. Um, would also presumably be a pretty robust thing, especially since that movement can then be directed to many different causes depending on what seems the most um, important. Um, so um, this is um, the basis of the Foundational Research Institute that I and some others um, in Basel founded. Um, the goal is to explore these crucial considerations for altruism and um, think harder about um, what is the best place to have an impact or even make sure that what we're what we plan to do is positive um, I don't think there's necessarily a single best place to have an impact there might be many that are important depending on your skills and interests um, but at least to identify some um, high impact and likely robust areas to to make a difference um, so I'll talk more about um, the two things I mentioned before um, cooperation and um, wisdom um, I'll start with wisdom and um, this is um, an example where I think there may be some divergence between short-term and long-term thinking. So um, it's common to, to see people encourage um, faster technology growth um, as a way to improve society and that makes a lot of sense in the short term because um, technology can solve a lot of problems. I mean like there's in vitro meat to help displace factory farms. Technology tends to improve wealth overall which includes reducing poverty. Um, technology improves quality of living in many ways, um, more powerfully than perhaps anything else. So um, there's a lot of potential in technology and like it seems like you want to get more technology as fast as possible because people are in poverty, um, animals are in factory farms and um, like it's really important to, to improve things. Um, this even applies for the suffering of animals in the wild. With faster technology we would be sooner able to 
help wild animals potentially. Um, but there's also risks of technology and there's even the possibility of um, locking in certain um, suboptimal outcomes for the long term. Um, one example is with AI. Um, it's possible that um, AI will be built to have stable goal preservation, in which case the way that you construct it now could matter for billions of years into the future and could um, expand to the whole um, galaxy. And so <clears throat> um, what matters more than how fast we build AI or how fast we develop technologies in general is how um, wisely we develop AI or technologies. Um, a little bit of improvement to the quality of the outcomes that we produce, if they're stable for the long term, would be um, vastly more important than um, having it 100 years sooner or even 1,000 years sooner. And this is um, the basic point that Nick Bostrom makes in his Astronomical Waste paper, um, where he argues that in the end, um, the safety of the future matters more than the speed. Um, and he was talking specifically about extinction risks primarily in that piece, but I think it applies actually more importantly for, especially for um, those who want to reduce suffering to other qualities of the future, like um, how much suffering it contains, how um, cooperative it is, um, and these other kinds of things that could matter a lot besides just extinction. There's a big difference between a totalitarian future um, and a cooperative nice future. Um, maybe even a bigger difference between than between no future and a cooperative future. So um, what we do now can um, have a can potentially have a big impact for the long term, um, and <clears throat> um, in this case, it's it, it's clear that um, just getting to AI or getting to other technologies as fast as possible may not be the best thing um, because society needs more time to um, develop wise political structures, social norms, institutions. Um, general understanding to better grapple with challenges that come forward and um, um, so what I would encourage is um, what, what uh, Luke Melhauser and Anna Solomon coined um, differential intellectual progress where you try to s selectively push faster on things like wisdom, um, cooperation, political um, sophistication um, and other kinds of social technologies rather than and, and also um, kind of um, intellectual progress in um, domains that, redu that um, reduce risks of suffering. Um, they said just risks in general, but I would focus on risks of suffering, um, rather than promoting um, technologies or ideas that um, expand like human power and ability to manipulate um, the planet, which um, need to be thought about carefully before they become available. Um, this is an extension of the original concept of differential technological development that Nick Bostrom um, coined, um, which is basically the same idea that you want to advance the risk-reducing technologies before the risk-increasing technologies. Um, so certainly some technologies are probably good. I mean, like certain aspects of the internet um, vastly improve the ability of people to learn and communicate and um, like network on important issues and things like that. Um, but um, many other <coughs> technologies um, are, are risky, including um, the pace of software that, um, or, or even more slow hardware um, that accelerate um, the possibility of AI, um, neuroscience that accelerates the possibility of AI and better understanding of how to build general AI, um, and um, even things like nanotech that can be destabilizing to the international system um, with the advent of nanotech weapons and things like that. In general, technologies are destabilizing, so um, it seems at least a priori that you might want um, to, to take it slower and have more time for social control. Like, governments are generally very slow compared to the private sector, and you need some government intervention to um, to, to solve prisoners' dilemmas or tragedy of the common situations that would otherwise result from just market forces. So um, there's, um, from that perspective, it seems important to, to take things slow. Of course, there are some who argue the opposite and say, um, with faster technology, we would have faster ability to develop countermeasures. And that's certainly um, 
a, a consideration as well. Like technology as a whole is not a, a uniform um, entity in this regard, but there are some that um, are positive, some that are more negative. So um, um, that's certainly a, a valid consideration. Um, but um, and so the 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 sign of promoting technology is not totally clear, but like I would be wary of assuming that it's positive, and I might in general assume that it, at least I, I don't want to actively <coughs> support um, technological progress as a whole, um, although um, I also wouldn't actively oppose it. I think it's, I think we should just kind of selectively push on social, social um, angles more than technology. Um, this also raises questions about economic growth, for example, um, economic growth advances um, technology and so from that perspective it, it might seem risky though there are also many other benefits like um, the fact that trade improves international cooperation um, in general economic growth improves uh, moral values and tolerance um, and um, a pre um, like um, civility toward outgroup members um, economic growth also improves um, the good technologies and um, education, all those kinds of things. So um, economic growth is even less, um, is is kind of a, a double-edged sword in that way. And I don't really have a good uh, opinion on the sign of promoting GDP as a whole. Um, but um, I, probably there are better things to push on that are clearly positive. Um, so um, in general, as I mentioned, I think a, a good heuristic is um, that the social sciences are kind of safer than technology um, and they're kind of maybe the most important areas to focus on in general. Things like um, international cooperation, um, political science, um, like social norms, um, psychology of um, group dynamics and like um, <clears throat> um, politics of uh, democracy, good governance, like ability to respond to social challenges, those kinds of things are kind of the, the first step that you would imagine for altruism because um, science or um, technological advances can come later once we have um, a better handle on working together um, and doing things that are positive for humanity. So, um, like, Science may be important to study up somewhat to inform us about the kinds of possibilities that are out there um, and the kinds of things that we um, might need to look out for. Um, but in terms of things to push on right now that move, the f um, move society in better directions for the far future, it seems as though um, the social side of things is, is generally safer um, and more urgent. Um, so. Um, now I'll talk a little bit more about cooperation specifically, um, which, as I said, is another um, intervention that seems fairly robustly positive. Um, and so, um, in particular, a lot of the opportunities here are in the realm of international cooperation. Um, so, um, this is important for solving global coordination problems, which will become um, especially prominent as technologies um, develop. Um, so in general with technology, um, whether AI or nanotech or biotech or um, anything else, um, there's the possibility for arms races where um, one country or one company um, races against another to build the technology faster and faster. And um, when, you're, so, um, when you're trying to develop the technology first, you have less um, time and um, you're less interested in things like what are the potential risks, what are the potential long-term consequences, um, will, this, will this cause um, suffering in the future, you don't really have time to think about how to reduce risks of suffering. Um, you might also, in the, in the um, case of um, say AI or nanotech, you might um, focus on military applications of the technology um, to the exclusion of more socially beneficial applications. And so the whole um, um, like force up the whole force of de development on the technology may um, move in a different direction when there's a competitive dynamic at play. Um, certainly, competition can sometimes be be good as well. Like in in the marketplace, when companies compete for better products, consumers benefit, and so on. But in the case of um, 
especially international comp um, competition or even competition among companies without concern for risks um, or like the externalities both to society in the short term and especially to the far future, then you've got more of a concern about um, the need to, to um, have coordination to prevent those um, problems. So um, one specific scenario you could imagine is, say, uh, an arms race between the US and China to build um, AI first, or even military robotics or nanotech weapons or something of that sort. Um, and so, um, so that's maybe not um, overwhelmingly likely. Um, there's hope that, especially given the strong trade between the US and China, that they will remain cooperative for the long term. But it's, some, it's a possibility that, that one could imagine. Um, and so things like that are um, the, the kinds of scenarios that we should be thinking about and also um, thinking about how to avoid. Um, so um, one of the main benefits of cooperation um, that I talked about is the fact that you can take things slower and have more time to um, think about the risks and think about how to design it so that it's um, best for many value systems, not just reducing suffering but also other things that people care about. And there may be um, significant opportunities to reduce suffering and um, do other things that other people care about if you have the time and the, the um, reflection to um, figure out how to do that. Um, and another benefit of cooperation is the fact that you can, um, the fact that when you are, um, choose a compromise point, you can get each side can get more of what it wanted than it would have gotten in expectation from a race. So for example, if there are two parties that each have a 50% chance of winning an arms race, um, they have a 50% chance of getting what they want or else um, they lose. Um, with compromise, in general, values are not in total opposition to each other. So um, it's possible to devise an arrangement whereby each side gets, say, 65% of what it wants. Um, and that's better than 50% um, in expectation if they race. So there are also these, there's also kind of a surplus from compromise that's due to the fact that you can, um, most values are not completely worth, uh, not completely anti um, parallel, and, and you can um, usually give different values um, a lot of what they want in some sort of um, negotiation. One example, so, sort of a fanciful example, but maybe it'll become relevant in the farther future. Um, is between the um, value of reducing wild animal suffering and the value of um, having natural ecosystems preserved. Um, so naively they seem to be in opposition, like every ecosystem that's preserved is um, additional wild animals that are suffering there. Um, but you could imagine ways to make it not completely in opposition. So for example, maybe the people who want to preserve ecosystems care somewhat about species diversity and so um, as long as you preserve um, like um, each species, um, then they might not care if you reduce the numbers of certain species that are very populous. Um, they may also care more about the big majestic animals, for example, rather than all, all the insects, or they might um, want diversity of ecosystems, but they don't care about how much you have, or even more speculative long-term things, like maybe they would be okay with um, um, re-engineering the animals not to suffer as much or um, introducing robotic animals that um, can shut themselves off when they're being um, eaten so that they don't suffer during the process of predation or various other scenarios that you can imagine. So um, those are ways that you could potentially um, give the, the nature people some of what they want without um, causing nearly as much suffering. Um, and so that could be better in expectation for both sides than trying to um, completely eliminate nature, which is likely to turn off the other side and um, arouse opposition and make them um, even less likely to um, be sympathetic to your views if they happen to win control. Um, so that's an intuition of where you can get benefits from compromise, um, like the, the surplus from, um, from splitting in the middle. Um, and then there are other important side effects of compromise as well, like um, the ability to control rogue actors who might be doing things that you didn't want. Um, the um, just the general heuristic that like world peace and cooperation is generally a very um, it, it is almost universally shared as a goal, and so it's it seems um, 
unlikely to be um, overturned by some consideration that you didn't think of. Um, and also the fact that many people appreciate cooperation. It's a very positive something. And so the fact that you're promoting cooperation is in, in itself a way to, comp to cooperate. It's a way to do something nice for others. And so um, they may look more favorably on your values. They may be more inclined to help you in the future with what you care about. Um, so those are the, the two topics I was going to mention. Um, there are many other things that, um, that are on my website or that I'm glad to discuss. Um, one other thing that has been d talked about before is um, wild animal suffering. Um, Ruri gave a talk a, f a few days ago. Um, and I mentioned um, that um, I think it's um, unwise to, inc to advocate um, like wholesale destruction of nature to reduce wild animal suffering, but rather an approach that um, that um, is less invasive um, makes more sense. So, for example, I think the um, maybe the easiest way to um, approach the issue is to focus on future suffering, like um, spreading wildlife into space, where um, humans might multiply wild animal suffering many times what's currently on Earth if they spread life into space, and in addition, um, you don't have a lot of the problems that you have with um, destroying ecosystems on Earth. For example, um, you can, um, like, um, w on Earth people rely on ecosystems for oxygen and medicines and um, various, um, like, agriculture or life-sustaining activities. So there are concerns about um, interfering there. There are concerns that, for example, certain sorts of environmental degradation, like um, climate change or even um, topsoil loss or water shortages could um, lead to more international instability, more conflict, and so on. Um, and then um, many people care a lot about existing ecosystems, but they don't have quite the same passion for creating new ecosystems of the same type. And so um, it's a lot easier to convince people that it, it's maybe not such a great thing to spread um, wild animal life. Um, in fact, if you ask people whether they would create um, wild animal life on another planet um, from scratch, they often say they don't really care or, or even that they would be opposed to it because it would be interfering with the um, uninhabited ecosystems on those planets. So um, that seems potentially a more, um, like a, a less abrasive way to um, frame the issue and p may have um, um, more payoff in the long run anyway. Um, I'm also interested in the suffering of insects. Um, as I mentioned, it was a revelation to me to realize that insects might suffer. And um, I, I still think their um, potential suffering is very significant. There are a billion billion insects on the planet, um, so almost a billion f insects for every human. And um, so there's some, um, some people say that they might count less because they're simpler and they, they have a much smaller brain and so on. And, and I agree that they probably count less than humans, but I think there's some argument to be made that they count at least more than their number of neurons would suggest because they're autonomous agents and they have their own utility functions. To themselves, they, they matter. To, to an individual insect, it matters more than anything else. It is the whole world to itself. And um, insects may also have um, more efficient brains, like um, when you've got a much bigger brain, you don't need to worry about optimizing every neuron. Um, insects fly and have lower um, metabolic um, consumption, so they need to be more optimized for efficiency. They may also have more neurons devoted to hedonic operations. So for all those reasons, they may um, count a lot more than their proportional number of neurons. Um, and even if you're counting raw neurons, um, it's, it seems like there are more um, insect neurons on the planet than um, human neurons, um, at least by a, one or two orders of magnitude. Um, so there are potentially um, realistic ways that we could um, address insect suffering. One that I've mentioned is um, humane insecticides, the idea of um, developing chemicals or other methods that um, kill insects in, to, with the same effectiveness, but in a more quick way or using some mechanism that's less painful. Um, I'm not sure if um, reducing insecticide use as a whole is a good thing because insecticides also re keep um, insect populations down and prevent a lot of natural births and deaths. 
Um, so um, I don't want my position to be mistaken for thinking that we should just favor organic farming. In fact, organic farming is sometimes worse than conventional farming because it uses natural predators um, that probably kill in a very painful way. Evolution should have optimized insects to find predation extremely painful. Um, and um, um, it, in general, organic farms have very high um, insect densities on, on the fields. So um, I'm not suggesting that organic is the way to go, but <clears throat> that developing more, more humane conventional um, approaches um, could be a realistic um, intervention that we could do to help insects. Um, so I think I'll stop there, um, but there are many more topics, so I'm glad to talk more. If you had a million dollars to spend, um, where would the million go? Well, um, I guess the, if, it, um, if it was totally um, without, usable without restrictions, I would probably save most of it for myself just because that's the most flexible um, strategy of all. Um, if it was being... Um, if it was, had to be donated to an organization, I would probably choose Foundational Research Institute because that's um, um, flexibly going to choose important areas to work on and address these big picture questions. And like, um, even if there were excess funds, um, in the worst case, we could just um, move them to whatever cause we thought was important. Um, other causes that I think are important in the short term include um, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, or MIRI. Um, they um, do important work on philosophy and um, cooperation in the future. Um, and so I think they're reasonably important in that respect. Um, I don't necessarily agree with them on their values um, or all the things that they work on, but I think on balance, um, the work they do is important enough that even if I only agree with some subset of it, um, it can still be very effective. I suspect you'll actually want to qualify one of your statements. You said society today is comparatively uh, humane. If one thinks that probably the greatest source of severe and readily avoidable suffering in the world today is factory farming, um, and yeah, the, the, the fact that non-human animals need to be uh, declawed, uh, tail docked, castrated, and all these terrible things to prevent them mutilating themselves and each other, uh, suggesting an extraordinarily high level of, uh, of, of, of distress. Although, in one sense, yes, uh, Pinker is, 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 is right in his uh, book, Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, clearly, in, in, in many respects, our, our civilization is, is pretty barbarous uh, by post human standards. Well, if you also include wild animals, then it's the world may have less suffering now than it did at any time in the recent memory. Um, humans have displaced a large amount of land. Um, <clears throat> and um, I mean, there, there are trends also to reduce factory farming and be more concerned about that. Although you're certainly right that um, the, um, the trend is more in, in relative terms and also from a human perspective. But, it's certainly plausible that as society develops um, more technologies, there will be more examples like factory farming of suffering that um, is caused by our technology that we don't um, care enough to avert or that we have other priorities. And so it, it's um, um, not um, reduced as much as we'd like. Um, one example that I mention in some of my pieces is um, suffering subroutines, the idea that um, the reinforcement learning algorithms and computations of uh, future civilization um, would probably involve suffering because that's a pretty instrumentally valuable property for an agent to have. So um, robots or um, intelligence workers like um, scientists and engineers and so on of a future civilization um, might suffer um, routinely um, and just because of the sheer magnitude of how many of, of them there are both because of cosmological scales as well as the greater efficiency of digital sentience, um, you would probably multiply suffering many times. But I think that's... Um, so I, th I think it's likely that future civilization will vastly increase suffering relative to what we see on Earth now. But the, the bigger issue is how much suffering there is. I think, um, it, like with the wild animal issue or like with any other issue, you don't push for perfection, you push for um, the best you can do. And I think like a, a relative, like if we can um, um, at least um, uh, 
address these issues and kind of have a, a, um, a relatively peaceful future in which um, we have social institutions that allow for different parties to um, push for their interests, then there's much more space to reduce those kinds of suffering than if you have um, just somebody building the first AI and not thinking at all about suffering subroutines. That could have many times more total suffering. So like the, um, the kinds of um, things that I was talking about offer the scope to reduce suffering substantially even if not get it to zero, even if not get it to less than we see today. Um, so I think we should focus more on avoiding the bad scenarios and making it pretty good rather than trying to get the best and probably making things worse in the process by alienating others. What are examples um, of possible interventions to increase or stabilize international cooperation? Um, so a lot of organizations work on this already. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, arms control seems like a pretty um, um, good template. Um, global governance is another. So in general, the um, idea of global governance seems pretty important as a goal, as a long-term goal, because um, you can... Um, so um, Thomas Hobbes wrote about this in the Leviathan, um, where he said, the state of nature is a war of all against all, um, but if you have a Leviathan that can enforce um, cooperation, essentially, and, and be a higher power that um, allows for contracts and positive sum arrangements to be enforced, then you can um, have, then everybody can benefit. And so the same thing potentially applies in the international sphere. Um, um, international relations scholars say that the, the international scene is still an anarchy, basically, because there's no ultimate power, there's nobody to um, help you if you're um, getting invaded. Um, we have, I guess we, to some extent, have um, for example, the United States that may intervene and act somewhat as a, a global superpower to help stabilize um, or destabilize, as the case may be. But um, we don't have any formal structures and there's no guarantee of protection the way that we have police for um, within country protection. So um, that seems pretty important for a lot of these issues that we're talking about because when you have a, a higher authority that can um, um, protect um, and kind of enforce the laws, then you can start doing uh, contracts, like you can start making deals, you can start um, I enforcing those deals in a more robust way. Um, like the, the concern with um, arms control arrangements, for example, is um, if your partner defects, then you're, um, you're at a loss because they, they're now ahead of you and there's nobody to um, undo that crime, basically. Um, so like the, it's, it's um, hard to make um, binding arms control agreements. And in fact, in the nuclear case, it um, rarely happened that, technolo that nuclear technologies were actually constrained by these agreements because um, you're just worried that the other side is developing something in secret and you can't tell and you don't want to um, find yourself in a position where they were doing that and you, you trusted them. So um, if you've got a robust international um, community that can help to um, maintain like international laws and agreements, then that um, problem would be reduced. There's also um, issues of um, transparency. Improving transparency should be pretty important um, going forward because um, like already we have problems verifying compliance with nuclear um, arms control and nuclear weapons are very big and generally visible. Um, the construction whereas things like um, nanotech weapons or AI are, um, can be done in very small places using technologies that look very harmless. So um, especially in that case, it becomes more and more important to have transparency. And we need to figure out how to um, allow for international transparency and like robust inspections where you can verify at will without um, like violating civil liberties too much. Um, other things that are important are um, more of a um, kind of psychological or um, sociological angle. Um, things like the value of internationalism, where you see yourself as a citizen of the world instead of um, a, a citizen of a country, because um, like a lot of the reason for arms races in the first place is because one country wants to beat the other. But if 
if everybody didn't care what country they were part of, then there wouldn't really be motivation for that. Um, and especially now, um, like the, the US and China um, have relatively similar values, at least compared to the US and the Soviet Union. So like in the, in the limit of an internationalist um, mindset, um, you wouldn't care as much if China beat the United States, for example. Um, and um, that can also just improve um, interest in global governance because a lot of times nationalist sentiments resist um, international institutions because they don't want to interfere with our autonomy and all those kinds of things. So um, having more appreciation for the importance of international governance would, um, would help make those arrangements actually work. Um, then other things in general for, that help with both general cooperation as well as international cooperation are um, tolerance of other uh, values, other cultures, other um, ways of thinking. Um, um, there's um, evidence that um, literature uh, can help get inside other people's minds. This also increases compassion in general, not just um, cooperation. Um, things like um, um, exchange with other cultures in terms of transferring cultural um, artifacts can reduce kind of xenophobia. Um, having people exchange in terms of like um, visiting other countries or um, like um, having conferences between countries. And um, David Pierce made an interesting proposal about um, uh, female governance. He was wondering whether if women ruled the world there would be more peace. Um, I think that's uh, rather I mean, that is, that's not going to happen, but we can empower women to have more um, power in their countries and that might reduce violence. Um, although there's also, you need to be aware of game theory and aware of the constraints of reality. So for example, if the United States unilaterally got rid of its nuclear weapons or something, that could potentially make things worse because it would destabilize um, deterrence equilibria that have existed for a long time. And um, more generally, there are a lot of um, realities of power politics that you need to be conscious of when you're designing these strategies. So, like um, even naive peace movements <coughs> may need m may need um, some modifications um, to make sure that they're actually advocating something something valuable. Um, but um, certainly, this the spirit of peace movements is is good. Um, and then, if we can channel it in the right directions, that's a good outcome. Yeah, perhaps I should just uh, add, I don't uh, actively campaign for all female government, the governments because I don't think it's sociologically realistic. It's almost impossible uh, to get anyone to consider it purely as a technical measure in the same way one does drink driving uh, and laws. But uh, yeah, it was just a, right. uh, a throwaway thing that uh, uh, Hank Felicia wrote up for an article. Yeah. I think the very marginal step is the more realistic one where you improve female education and empowerment in various countries and in general the ability of women to have an impact on the political process. Do you want to comment on um, some questions that the Foundational Research Institute might work on or that you'd advise other people to work on if they were interested in doing so? Sure. Um, what are some dominating future scenarios? For example, what kinds of AIs are likely would, will it be um, a single AI that um, goes foom on its own, or will it will we start with whole brain emulation, or will we start with um, like a more distributed AI that's shared by many parties? Um, that can affect where we try to um, influence. Um, like um, if we think that um, it's going to be an individual AI, then individual AI developers may be more important to. Um, um, like to reach with our messages. Um, it also matters whether AI is developed by companies or governments or individuals. Um, in, if it's developed by the governments, then international cooperation becomes more important. Um, although um, governance structures are important regardless because um, it seems as though you need some sort of way to manage who builds AI and who gets to decide how it happens. Um, other questions um, that are relevant include um, um, exploring um, like scenarios for aliens, um, what kinds of values would they have, um, how many are there, are we likely to interact with them. Um, 
my, my guess is that um, on average aliens would be um, less we would like alien values less than our own because we come from our own values but it's not clear how much less and um, certainly there's um, there's value in kind of um, multi not just multiculturalism but kind of expanded multiculturalism where you um, can appreciate um, values very different from your own. Um, I think um, moral um, cooperation and tolerance is important, um, like understanding um, where people's values come from and what leads people to be more um, tolerant of others. Um, um, there's a lot of social psychology uh, and social moral psychology research in um, like where our intuitions come from. and. One hypothesis I have is that as people think more about the determinants of their values, they'll be more open to seeing um, the arbitrariness of their believing this instead of that. And so there may be more opportunity for people to um, respect each other because they can see like um, this genetic property or this the fact that I had this experience as a child is um, the main reason that I feel this way um, instead of some other way. So. Um, that could potentially encourage um, tolerance as well. Um, and um, then there are some other kind of meta questions about um, like the best strategy to use, um, whether we should um, do more movement building or more research, um, like um, um, epistemological questions, how certain should we be about what we believe in our foundational assumptions versus how seriously should we take very strange views that other people hold? Um, and um, many more questions. And then there's a, a set of questions in wild animal suffering as well that are um, relevant to reducing wild animal suffering in the short term. Although, as I mentioned, I think it's also important to focus on um, preventing the spread of wild animal suffering.